Here we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Angie Raymond, and welcome to the Bloomington campus, where we are sitting in the Ostrom workshop. Uh, I'm going to not give you a huge long introduction, other than to say this today is hosted thanks to Doc and Joy Searles through the Data Management and Information Governance Program at the Ostrom Workshop. And we're incredibly proud, of course, of the speaker that we have today. So I'm now going to turn it over to Doc so we can get out of uh, the way and let her <laughs> speak. Hey, everybody. I'm sure all of you know me. I don't need any introduction. Um, I, I have been uh, a fan of Shoshana Zuboff since the 1980s, where I think I have an original copy of her book, In the Age of the Smart Machine, The Future of Work and Power. And that has been, that alone was an influence on everything we've done since, but also her book, The Support Economy, Why Corporations Are Failing Individuals, a focus of Project VRM and our work here, uh, and the next episode of Capitalism, and then most famously, uh, the, the Age of Surveillance Capitalism, the Fight for the Human Future and the New Frontier of Power, which I think is now in 23 languages at last count. Um, and it's um, what Shoshana has done with that has given us um, an expression that the whole world is using now. And, but she, that was several years ago, she came out with that book. She's been very busy since then, and she has a lot to say. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to her. Hey, Doc. Nice to see you, even though it's all virtual. All right. <laughs> I'm so happy to be uh, here today um, and uh, in the Ostrom workshop celebrating the, the great intellectual contributions of um, Professor Ostrom and, um, and, and what a legacy. That's um, something that's been part of my life for, for so many years. Um, so, and thank you, thank you, Joyce, thank you, Doc, thanks everybody for coming. Um, it, this is really fun for me to be able to talk to, to you, to relatively small group, not too small, but just the right size, Goldilocks wise, and, um, you know, and people who I know are, are interested in this field and, and, and know their way around. So, as Doc intimated, um, what I, what I wanted to do today was share some glimpses of a new paper that I've recently completed where I've tried to put together what I have been you know, thinking and, and working on since the publication of the book. And um, so I'm, I'm gonna start with some setup for those of you who still don't know what surveillance capitalism is, I try to never take that for granted. So I'm gonna start with some setup and then, and then get into some of the new material. And as I do that, I'll, I'll explain to you why uh, I wanted to, to share material from this paper with you today. And most of all, the perspective of this paper. So let's just start by saying that um, we have a shared fate and not only those of us who are here today, but all of those that we try to interact with every day in our cultural and political spaces, we have a shared fate. And that is to live at the dawn of an information civilization. Uh, no one's ever done this before. In an information civilization, our, uh, our lives are rendered as and mediated by information puts a lot of pressure on that little word information. So my questions are, what information is produced? Who knows that information? Who decides who knows that information? And who decides who decides who knows? These, if you don't know them already, that's all you have to remember from this talk because those are the four essential questions of the production and distribution of knowledge, the authority that governs that production and distribution, and the power that sustains that authority. The answers to these questions define the social order of an information civilization. In the year 2022, however, uh, across uh, so many of our societies, it is the surveillance capitalist firms, beginning with the giants, Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, that hold the answers to each of these questions. 
though we never elected them to govern. Not surprisingly then, in 2021, these five tech giants were five of the six largest publicly traded companies by market capitalization in the world. What began as an American story in the year 2000, 2001, quickly became a global story. And just in case you're not up on the numbers in the last dozen years, Facebook's monthly visitors increased from 100 million to nearly 3 billion from every region on earth. And Google's rose from 8 billion to nearly 90 billion people worldwide. So surveillance capitalism's fledgling internet startups have during these last two decades transformed into what I now think of and write about as a sweeping political, economic, institutional order. An institutional order rides above. It spans individuals, communities, societies, organizations, sectors, economies, nations, by now intermediating virtually all human engagement with digital architectures across every domain of everyday life. Why is this called surveillance capitalism? Let's just get that out of the way for a moment. It's because surveillance capitalism brings into the 21st century core elements of traditional capitalism, private property, market exchange, growth and profit. But these cannot be realized without the technologies and social relations of surveillance. Hidden methods of observation secretly consume once private experience and translate that experience into behavioral data. They operate outside of human awareness, robbing actors of the right to know and with it the right to combat. In an extraordinary development, these ill-gotten human-generated data are then immediately claimed as private property corporate assets now available for manufacture and sales. So the theory of surveillance capitalism challenges this property claim and redefines it as theft. In today's surveillance economy, personal information is the stolen treasure and surveillance is the getaway car. The entire economic edifice is built on this illegitimate, but not yet illegal bed of sand. So these data join complex supply chains. They travel to computational factories. They are computed into behavioral predictions and finally sold to business customers in a new kind of market that trades in predictive knowledge of human behavior. Surveillance capitalists sell the promise of certainty a promise which requires data extraction and computation at an unprecedented and therefore for most humans unimaginable scale. The first globally successful prediction product, I don't have to tell any of you this, was the click-through rate sold into the first stunningly lucrative human futures markets known euphemistically as online targeted advertising. And it always astonishes me that all of the social wreckage that has followed in the wake of these inventions are at the hands of something so unbelievably banal as advertising. All right, since those days, however, we can say for certain that surveillance capitalism has metastasized across every economic sector, something that we can easily talk about later. So the point now is that in these machine-based economic systems, personal information, human-generated data is a bulk commodity. It, it trades like tons of wheat or barrels of oil. It's computed like tons of wheat or barrels of oil. It's valued for volume and variety and signal richness, nothing else. A leaked Facebook document that you may recall describes 
its AI manufacturing hub in a way that gives us a little sense of this volume and variety. Um, the, the AI is described as, quote, ingesting trillions of data points each day to produce thousands of models each day and six million behavioral predictions per second. So for the first time in human history, information is knowingly, actively severed from its meaning from the undersea cables to the AI training models and all of the predictions, none of it is engineered to discern or respond to meaning. None of it can, none of it should, according to its own objectives, distinguish between information integrity and information corruption. In fact, as we have all learned, when it comes to surveillance capitalism, the economic system around the technology system, information integrity is inversely correlated with revenue. I, I, did you hear me say that? Because I really want that to sink in because that really makes a difference to everything we're talking about. From the ancestral disciplines of oral witness, to the traumatic shift from the spoken to the written word, each turn in the material history of information and communication saw people laboring, societies laboring to assert some way of assigning social standards to information integrity. That's until now. So surveillance capitalism moves forward without any of these historical burdens. How does it do that? Well, for the first, for the first thing, it was nurtured by an economic ideology that substituted market freedom for political freedom, inducing democratic governments to sacrifice their governance prerogatives at the altar of market dominance. And it was sustained by a war on terror that turned nation states and democratic governments to the internet companies as their key source of population data and monitoring. Okay, so now that's the setup. Where are we now? The public, lawmakers, and experts alike are thwarted by category errors. I include myself and all of us. So you know that feeling of reading today's headlines. And every day there are so many headlines reporting the latest atrocities to come out of this entire institutional order. And every day we're kind of whipsawed and our attention is drawn here and there, the social harms produced by surveillance capitalism are siloed. They're treated as disparate crises. For example, the destruction of privacy, the rise of disinformation, collective scale behavioral modification. Each of these is regarded as discrete phenomena. They each have their own specialists their own solutions, their own congressional committees and parliamentary committees, their own specific laws or regulations to the extent that there ever are any. There is far too little, dangerously too little awareness of the larger institutional order within which these manifestations, each of them are linked in a systemic developmental pattern of cause and effect. So this is the, the new paper that I wanna share uh, with you, which I, I call the unified field perspective. And what, what my, my endeavor has been for the last couple of years was to try and understand now, not only that we're, we're dealing now with a, an economic logic that grew into a global-sized 
institutional order, but that this institutional order, like all institutional orders, develops in time. Institutional orders either develop or they deinstitutionalize, and in some rare cases, they reinstitutionalize. So, how does this institutional order develop? The, the lens of a developing institutional order to me offers a solution to that Tower of Babel of discrete phenomena that have us running in different directions every day. The lens reveals the organic and temporal interdependence of a series of developmental stages. These constitute a unified field of hierarchically integrated, path-dependent causes and effects, which combine in a single comprehensive arc of institutional development. Each stage manifests in novel economic operations, governance conquests, and social harms distinct to each stage, but each stage creating the conditions and the constructs and the scaffolding for the next. Each builds on and extends what went before. Each is carried by the momentum of earlier means of institutional self-reproduction, and each produces novel means that sustain, extend, and elaborate the institutional order. So early stages are causes of later stages, which are effects, which are in themselves causes of later stage effects. So I wanna very briefly describe what is within view at this point, which are four stages of development that I identify in, in this work. And um, I'm, I'm gonna to try to skip over this quite briefly in the view that, you know, as we get into questions and discussion, we can dig into any of this that intrigues you. But I've written so much on each of these stages that I, I felt like I had to really keep this to bullet points lest I run the risk of, of overstaying my welcome. So stage one, this is the foundations of everything. This is where all the data aggregation and data supply chains are founded, without which we could just go home and have a beer now because we would have nothing to talk about. So economic operations at this stage, and, and the way my thinking goes is I'm defining each stage according to the core economic operations, and then looking at the way in which the order is embellished, is enlarged, as it annexes governance functions at each stage. And then also at the way the order um, um, produces assaults on, on what is outside of it. And that is, um, and that is through the social harms that get you know, thrown out of its orbit into society uh, and help to weaken uh, its adversaries. Okay, so economic operations here, the core economic operation is what I'm calling the secret massive scale extraction of human generated data. And what this does is it establishes ubiquitous systems of secret behavioral data extraction, which as I mentioned are claimed as private property and corporate assets. So let's talk about governance for a moment. So when we're talking about institutional orders, they don't exist in a vacuum. I'm sure that's obvious. And so the question is, what is outside of an institutional order? And when an institutional order develops, or for that matter, when it deinstitutionalizes or undergoes any sort of change, what are the causes of, of these sorts of, of change? Well, institutional orders, you know, they're, they're not in a vacuum. Um, they're in a context of other institutional orders. In the case of surveillance capitalism, my analysis is that there is only one countervailing institutional order that actually has 
the power, um, the depth of institutionalization and the power to contradict surveillance capitalism as a social order. Only one has the power to effectively contradict this global institutional order. And that adversarial, that contradictory institutional order is democracy itself. Now, I know surveillance capitalists don't tend to think of democracy that way. And uh, many who have been wed to the economic ideologies that have um, you know, uh, destroyed much of the world over the past five decades, um, many who still believe in the, in the gods of self-regulation don't think that democracy um, has much punch left, but I really disagree with that. Democracy has the one thing and only democracy has the one thing that the surveillance capitalists truly, truly fear. And that is the ability to make, impose, and enforce law. And everything that, that the surveillance capitalists do um, proactively to weaken what is outside them and strengthen what is inside them is directed at weakening the democratic order. And that in and of itself is a sure signal of how important this order is to them and how much they recognize it as their only really viable adversary. Okay, so this is why talking about governance accretions at each stage is so important because the governance accretions accomplished by surveillance capitalism actually live in a zero sum relationship with the democratic order. And that's kind of the, the, the heart of, of this, whole, um, this whole landscape, this whole panoramic picture of um, the clash of institutional orders as being formative of information civilization. So at this first stage, the key governance capabilities that are annexed are rights specifically rights to know, uh, which is what I've been referring to as epistemic rights. There are many forms of epistemic rights. For example, um, when the European High Court ruled on the right to be forgotten as something that would be codified in European law, the right to be forgotten is one subspeciation, if you will, of epistemic rights. Um, when we talk about massive scale extraction of human generated data, we're talking largely about rights to what I think of as self knowledge. And the way I write that is self um, uh, backslash knowledge, not hyphen. So it's not about how well do I know myself, but it's about who has the right to knowledge about myself. Now, in the modern age, we have taken it for granted, which is to say we have held it as a kind of elemental right that individuals are the people who have the rights uh, to their own uh, personal experience, have the rights to decide what of that personal experience is known and who knows it and for what purpose. This is something that was um, specifically articulated by in the United States by Justice Douglas um, in a, um, a rather well-known Supreme Court opinion. Um, and the, the point is that what he was making clear was that these knowledge rights are decision rights. And in his view, he's arguing that the Bill of Rights gives every citizen the decision rights to decide what's public and what's private. This is very, very important because what it clarifies that epistemic rights precede privacy. Having these epistemic decision rights, what do I share, what remains private, 
means that rights are the cause of which privacy is the effect. So in the governance annexation uh, through secret massive scale extraction, there is an um, implicit annexation of these epistemic rights. And with that annexation, privacy also migrates to this corporate realm, to the surveillance capitalist institutional order. If you're wondering, wondering what's happened to privacy, it's not that privacy uh, has been completely destroyed, it's that privacy has been sequestered in this private corporate regime. So let's talk about social harms. And there are two key social harms, which again are foundational to everything that follows. The first is when it comes to people and society. I would refer to this as the wholesale destruction of privacy in our time. Whatever privacy there is, as I've said, is now hoarded within the surveillance capitalist regime behind the ubiquitous one-way mirrors of their um, extraction operations. But for the rest of us, uh, privacy has been destroyed. And I recognize that that may not be always a popular thing to say in the sense that there are many people who are working uh, wholeheartedly, passionately, sincerely, and earnestly on privacy law, privacy protection, data protection, um, uh, all, and all of the things that, that go with that. Well, what I wanna suggest is that what we need to be thinking about now in the year 2022 is what does it mean um, to work on privacy law after privacy has been destroyed? And I suggest that the outcome of such a question or a line of inquiry um, uh, sends us off to some very different kinds of answers than the answers that we found working on privacy law before privacy had been destroyed. But I would submit to you that privacy, even as we knew it in the year 2000, not that long ago, um, simply no longer exists. And unfortunately, many of our privacy discussions today, um, not only among, among experts and specialists and students and so forth, but um, within our, uh, you know, our Congresses and our, and our parliaments, um, many of these uh, conversations have a zombie-like quality where the, the language marches on uh, but the, rea the underlying realities have changed fundamentally. So the second major social harm that emerges here is the rise of, of what I'm calling epistemic chaos. And um, so epistemic chaos is a function of social information and communication now flowing through information and economic systems that are not constructed uh, to be able to, or even to desire to perceive or respond to meaning. This is what I call radical indifference. Of course, it has another kind of language if we're looking at it from the system's point of view, uh, where we know that information is intended to mean something other than its ordinary use. Information is intended uh, to refer to, you know, binary units, uh, which are orthogonal to meaning. They have nothing to do with meaning as we understand it in our social discourse. But now we have an economic system that is equally constructed as indifferent to meaning. And this is what I call radical indifference as we combine the technology and the economic systems. We're talking about radical indifference to information integrity. And this is institutionalized uh, inside these systems. And this is what produces epistemic chaos because now we have the information, the global information 
um, bloodstream, if you will, uh, which is open, not only open, but actively <laughs> every bit and bite of information is actively being solicited because don't forget, we need massive volume and variety. Um, and of course, there is no way to uh, gatekeep, judge, or render uh, information integrity. So the result here is epistemic chaos, poisoning social discourse, driving polarization, and all of the other scourges that we discuss when we talk about disinformation, misinformation, and so forth. Um, okay, so I want to go on to stage two, uh, and this, this stage uh, really revolves around the privatization of knowledge production. And of course, this is building on the massive aggregations of data accomplished in stage one as a result of, of the dynamics I've just, I've just discussed. So now in stage two, economic operations, uh, are building out the deep global infrastructures, systems, science, and, uh, and labor forces uh, required to master the computational means of knowledge production. And these are known as machine learning, artificial intelligence. The giants and their ecosystems know more about people and society than has ever been known. And they also know more about people and society than either people or society can know. The giants own that knowledge and control its distribution because they dominate on a global basis AI markets in knowledge production and consumption. The concentration of AI knowledge production and consumption is entirely now uh, dominated by the surveillance capitalist giants. And so when it comes to governance, what is being, um, 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 you know, what is being um, annexed, what is being uh, confiscated, what is being commandeered out of the democratic order into the surveillance capitalist order is essentially epistemic authority over knowledge production and consumption. So my shorthand for this is private control, privatization over the division of learning in society. And I argue that the division of learning in society in, in our era, information in civilization, information society, whatever nomenclature you like, but in any case, this division of learning um, is to information uh, civilization what the division of labor was to industrial civilization, the basis of social order. And when it comes to social harms, uh, what we see is a wholly new axis of social inequality. This is epistemic inequality defined by the growing gap between what I can know and what can be known about me. The benefits of these vast capabilities are not directed toward society, but rather toward advancing the giant's economic interests. Knowledge production depends upon data from people, but the knowledge that is produced is not for people. Knowledge is scraped from human lives, from the dimensions of human lives uh, until recently, regarded as private, but it is not dedicated to the improvement of those lives. The belief that big tech democratizes knowledge has obscured this new source of injustice for so long uh, that it's really made it difficult for us to see clearly the, that how the destruction of privacy in stage one gives way to extreme epistemic inequality in stage two. All right, stage three. This stage revolves around uh, what, uh, what I call remote behavioral actuation. This is a stage, this is a really important moment 
when you know we've built these huge data flows uh, concentrated in this institutional order. We've built the massive global infrastructure of knowledge production and consumption. And now we see all of that coming to fruition in stage three as knowledge is transformed into power. And this is now power that is able to remotely actuate individual and collective behavior. Knowledge is weaponized as targeting algorithms, engineered to tune, herd, and shape behavior in ways that maximize extraction, predictability, and revenue. Machine systems blindly, because they are built to be blind, blindly favor the most corrupt information simply because we know uh, that disseminating this information best fulfills its economic metrics. Those metrics, as you know, are oriented toward extract, uh, toward uh, what is called engagement, which is a euphemism for enlarging the extraction footprint, which is necessary as a reproductive mechanism so that all of the operations of stage one and of stage two uh, continue robustly, even as the leading edge of development moves on. So algorithmic targeting affects human action. It disrupts the integrity of individual and collective behavior. In the case of Facebook, we have so many extraordinary examples, um, you know, written out in plain English in so many journalistic articles and the testimony of so many people, including most recently Francis Hogan, um, you know, very specific descriptions of how a single man, happens to be Mark Zuckerberg, can choose on a Tuesday or a Friday to affect the behavior of billions of people with algorithmic tweaks or refuse to make those tweaks. And what fascinates me is how these descriptions are lying around in plain sight and how they don't ignite absolute just demonstrations in the streets because these are actual, um, these are actual performances of really what is an unprecedented and absolutist power. It has never existed before. So this is what I call instrumentarian power to be distinguished from the forms of power that we tragically became acquainted with in the 20th century, totalitarianism, authoritarianism, and of course, we're seeing that neither of these has died. They, they go through cycles, they go to sleep for a while. We see totalitarianism re rearing, it, re rearing its head again right now. Um, and, um, and of course, authoritarianism has been on the rise, something that we can perhaps talk about um, in a moment and, and, and talk about again in our discussion, but the point right now is that uh, instrumentarian power is distinct from these earlier forms of power with, uh, with which we're well acquainted, sadly. Instrumentarian power works its way silently and remotely through the instrumentation of the digital milieu. And that is how it achieves secret massive scale extraction because it is engineered to be invisible. It is engineered to keep its objects in ignorance. And so now we see, um, you know, these, these sort of images of Mr. Zuckerberg. I picture him uh, playing a celestial keyboard uh, as he plays a little note here and anger across the world is rewarded or ignored. News stories become more trustworthy or unhinged. Publishers prosper or wither 
political discourse turns uglier or more moderate, people live or people die. So governance here challenges rights of action, actually intervening in the power to shape society through secret, uncontestable means of intervening in the integrity of individual and collective behavior. And what we've learned the hard way, unfortunately, is that everything I've just described not only applies to commerce, to the everyday bread and butter targeting mechanisms of surveillance capitalism in these uh, worlds of, um, of uh, creating predictions and selling them in uh, futures markets, but that these same operations just pivoted a couple of degrees have become essential to political activity as well and form an entirely new genre of political power. And this is where we see that the surveillance capitalist institutional order built to be blind to meaning uh, has actually just laid out a kind of giant welcome mat to every autocrat and bad actor who can march into the information bloodstream and, and avail themselves of uh, all of the amenities of instrumentarian power and achieve their will that way. Um, the social harms here, I'm sure, are evident to you. The undermining of human autonomy, uh, the undermining of freedom of choice, uh, the assault on social solidarity, and the weakening of democratic institutions. Which brings us to stage four, which I call systemic dominance. So now we see that by virtue of the, um, the uh, private agglomerations of data, the private dominance of knowledge, the private dominance of the means of turning that knowledge into power and actually intervening now, coming back to the sources of those data in the first place uh, to shape behavior individually and collectively. Now, the uh, power and control that has accrued inside these companies uh, is truly magnificent, truly colossal, and of course, truly unprecedented. And the, the giants know this. And what we see in stage four is, a, is an increasing um, uh, willingness on their parts to show up mano a mano with democracy, with elected officials, and appointed democratic officials to show up and, and vie for uh, which institutional order will determine the rules and the values and the laws and the norms that will govern society. And so here what the, what the, um, what the companies are doing is leveraging their complete control over critical information systems and infrastructure to compete with democracy over all of these uh, key levers of governance. And I'll, I'll just throw out very, very quickly a, a couple of examples. So early in the pandemic, and this stands for me as perhaps one of the most um, egregious examples, uh, Early in the pandemic, uh, we saw Apple and Google parachute into the European Union, April 2020, um, just as uh, teams there were completing their work on contact tracing and exposure notification apps that were gonna work across the union and also within member states, and they were gonna be linked to public health authorities. And um, presumably they were going to be very important 
in uh, helping public health authorities in the member states control the plague. But Apple and Google had other thoughts. Um, I've spent um, a good part of the last few years uh, trying to figure out exactly what those thoughts were. I think I've got a pretty good grasp of it, but I'm, I'm not gonna go into it now. But the point is that um, these folks parachuted in with an exposure notification protocol that they borrowed some PR language, unfortunately, from a group of well-meaning data scientists. And they announced to the world that their exposure notification call, and this is Apple and Google, uh, their, their work, they said, was privacy preserving, decentralized, while the work of the democratic governments was centralized, was not going to respect privacy, um, cast as a big brother. This was a public relations coup. Um, it was untrue at the time and subsequent research has proved uh, the utter lack of validity in those kinds of uh, statements and, and that, that kind of rhetoric. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the companies uh, met with uh, democratically elected officials, argued with democratically elected officials, and categorically refused to make the tweaks in their operating systems that would allow the EU systems to work on, on the uh, mobile phones, Androids and, and iOS. And uh, that to me was a stunning show of this stage four behavior, which I refer to as a fight for the governance of governance. That's where we are now. So there are other examples. There's you know, Facebook choosing to shut down many of its pages in Australia rather than negotiate with the Australian parliament over fees for news content. There's Apple deciding when to use its app store to confront the destruction of privacy, but also when to look the other way, which it seems to have done for quite a few years. It's Facebook's self-authorizing oversight board. The social harms here, I'll just uh, leave you with one uh, big thought, and that is that as stage four progresses, it means that we are no longer self-governing citizens of democratic societies. So not long ago, we anticipated a golden age of the democratization of knowledge. That dream may yet be realized, but not right now, because right now our societies stumble toward a future that most of us did not and would not choose. I think of this as an accidental dystopia, an accidental dystopia. This is not, of course, a technology story. It's not a tale of just specific corporations and leaders. It's a story about power. It's a story about an economic logic that grew into an institutional order and there was no law to stop it. It's a story about the abdication of our information and communication spaces to surveillance capitalism and how this has become the meta crisis of every republic because it, struck, it obstructs the solutions to all other crises. Um, in my view, the time has come for a reckoning with the most basic questions of an information civilization our prospects for humane and just societies, for social solidarity, for shared prosperity, and most profoundly, for the endurance and sustenance of democratic principles and governance, wholly depend upon our delineation of new rights, the laws that protect them, and the public institutions that govern them. Purpose built for our time. This is the landscape of social invention that must be undertaken for our new age. And to conclude, I'm just going to um, conclude on, um, on um, 
what I think you'll regard as a happy note, an optimistic note. And I, I want to do that because I am incredibly optimistic. Uh, I will go to the end. <laughs> I will never give up on democracy, and, and I hope that you feel the same way. Um, democracy uh, is fragile, and every generation is called to its defense. I've lived with it, and I've lived without it. But I do believe that it is the best idea to have emerged from the human story, and that we have to fight for it. So, I would just mention, this is super quick, um, three conditions if we are to beat back the, um, the, uh, the, the aura of inevitability that has accrued to this giant institutional order um, and, uh, and see the resurgence of the democratic order. Uh, three conditions that we need to fulfill. One is public awareness and mobilization. A second is uh, we need a vanguard of lawmakers and policymakers who get this, who get um, this unified perspective, who get what this institutional order is all about, who get that we're not talking about this Tower of Babel of different problems, but we're talking about one central problem and that unless we address the secret massive scale extraction of human generated data nothing is going to change and finally the third condition we need transatlantic yes but also transnational political collaboration among citizens and lawmakers so until we have this that aura of inevitability will stand. Um, so here's a little story that I wanna tell you because I believe that there, are, there is already evidence that these three conditions uh, are being fulfilled in some narrow domains, uh, but if they can be fulfilled here, they can be fulfilled everywhere. Uh, and that's what I'm extremely excited about and I'll, I'll start this thought with just a nice little story about, you know, that ubiquitous um, spokesperson uh, for every harm to democracy that I have uh, been discussing in the past, however long I've been talking. Um, and that is um, the pervasive and ubiquitous Eric Schmidt, um, who boasted at the beginning of the pandemic that he believed that the COVID-19 would teach Americans, he was speaking to Americans in this particular uh, remark, would teach Americans to be, quote, a little bit grateful for powerful technology companies. And then we saw the other tech executives welcoming what they believed would be the inevitable end of the tech lash because everybody would be so dependent on their products and services that we would forget to be uh, mad at them. Okay, that's exactly what didn't happen. So what did happen was a complete rupture of public faith with these companies beyond TechLash into complete rupture. Um, I'm only gonna say a few numbers, not because I want you to remember them, but I just want you to hear the percentiles. So July 2020, 77% of Americans, so these are American survey data, but that's not really so bad since Americans have been last to this party. 70% um, saying tech companies have too much power. 94% saying they're really concerned about privacy. 92% really concerned about, concerned about disinformation. Then by January, 2021, an accountable tech poll 71% favoring regulatory intervention. 81% want privacy more than they want targeted ads. 73% opposed to tracking. 84% want to ban social media companies from boosting extreme content. 81% want to ban the collection of personal data. 
These are the kinds of percentiles that, as most of you know, we never see in surveys, let alone surveys on this subject. By July 21, the Future of Technology Commission, small commission set up by the White House, 93% of respondents, the highest percentage of, of anything in the, in the entire survey, 93% of the respondents agreed with the following statement, quote, it should be illegal for private companies to collect information about people without their permission. How about that? No more secret massive scale extraction, done. So here we have evidence of public mobilization. The public, perhaps, I mean, obviously we all know taking a survey is not the same as marching in the streets, but it certainly is a precursor. And these kinds of percentiles are extraordinary. Now, we see a vanguard of lawmakers and policy makers emerging both in the US and the EU who have rallied around the idea of outlawing, quote, surveillance advertising, which as you know, was the economic juggernaut there at the birth and remains at the heart of surveillance capitalism, particularly when it comes to Facebook, um, Google, and Amazon now. So on March 24th, uh, 2021, in the United States Congress, hearings on, on disinformation, Anna Eshoo, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, announces a forthcoming bill to ban surveillance advertising. Three months later, she introduces uh, the act to ban micro-targeting in political advertising. In January, um, and then uh, the uh, EU parliamentarians uh, working on the Digital Services Act. Um, now, this is a watershed piece of legislative framework uh, that has um, you know, essentially passed earlier this year some fine points on the amendments are still to be haggled over uh, this spring. But in June of, of 2021, um, we see uh, a member of European Parliament and uh, a member of Congress doing a public event uh, online on the subject of banning surveillance advertising. And then uh, later uh, that very month, uh, we see a who's who of civil society institutions signing a people's declaration, giving it to the UN, I mean, sorry, giving it to the European Parliament. Uh, and the point here is uh, telling the European Parliament, we want you to ban surveillance advertising. And then in September of 2021, we see uh, Accountable Tech um, submitting a petition to the FTC in the United States for rulemaking that would ban surveillance advertising. And then we see now in the winter, January, 2022, um, uh, Congresswoman Eshoo uh, joined by Senator Cory Booker introducing a ban on uh, surveillance advertising, the Banning Surveillance yeah. Advertising Act. And meanwhile, uh, the Digital uh, Services Act is passed with a very important amendment uh, that if it moves through uh, the spring uh, intact, will uh, certainly ban surveillance advertising. So here we see um, uh, what I believe is largely an unheralded sea change in what Americans and European, and European citizens and lawmakers are willing to tolerate and ready to fight for. Okay, Shoshana, we're, we're past that. Yeah, we've passed an hour and we've got, we're oh back out on, on questions. So okay. um, we have uh, David Mack, Johannes Ernst and Jeff Wergel lined up, but um, Ben in the, uh, in the chat asked a question, I think uh, we could be brief. Uh, do we have to wait for politicians or can we shift demand in a way that shifts incentives to do the right thing. Um, he says more than that, but we can we can start there. Could you just repeat that question? Oh, he um, says, uh, do we have to wait for politicians or can we shift demand in a way that shapes incentives to do the right thing? 
Well, um, we're not going to be able to shift demand until we get competition. And we're not going to be able to get competition until we have laws that eliminate the surveillance dividend. Uh, until then, the, um, the investment and, uh, um, uh, and all the activity uh, is, is going into this dominant economic logic, uh, which is offering premiums. And um, we're not going to break that cycle until law intervenes to break the cycle and open up the competitive landscape. Okay, so David Mackey uh, is first with a hand up. And for other people, you raise your hand in the reactions button. It's at the bottom of the screen. Thanks, Doc. And, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Zuboff. I really um, appreciate the work that you've done in the past. I appreciate and want to thank you for what you, the current work that you shared with us today. And lastly, I want to thank you for giving us some language to have a conversation about these important issues. The question I have for you is related to the fact that we are at an Ostrom workshop. And there has been some excellent work done by Eleanor Ostrom in the realm of institutional analysis and also maybe to a lesser degree with where she was in her later work in, re in relation to the knowledge commons. And I'm, the question I have for you is, I wonder if, if there may be, if you think there may be an opportunity to connect some of the work that has come out of the Ostrom group with the work that you're currently doing. Thank oh, you. Oh, I, I think there's a tremendous um, overlap and convergence there. Uh, and, um, you know, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, when we're talking about the uh, global information and communications domain, we are talking about this uh, new kind of, uh, of uh, collective undertaking, uh, which as I've described has been uh, hijacked and, uh, and, and overtaken by um, a very specific form of private power. And so, yes, the answer is yes, absolutely. And um, um, I, I am referring to um, Ostrom's work um, in this paper, and um, and I and I think that you know that that work is um, perennial and very very germane to to these issues. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. So uh, Johannes has his hand up next, and we have uh, uh, Elizabeth and others in the chat. So go ahead, Johannes. I am trying to be uh, quick. Um, so first of all, what a depressing picture you were outlining here. I thought we had a privacy problem, but I think the problem you outlined is a much, much larger problem than a privacy problem. Particularly, I'm fascinated by how you uh, position surveillance capitalism as sort of the opposite or indirect opposition to democracy. You know, I think a lot of us thought democracy had other kind of opponents than surveillance capitalism. But um, here we are, uh, and that's probably a, a, a very good framing. Um, my, the, however, democracy itself today is in a crisis uh, on, on multiple levels. And um, one of my questions would be on what level of size of polity is the change most likely to happen? When you're talking about it, it seems to be on a level of nation states or thereabouts, uh, you kind of, uh, you know, US kind of entities. Is there other avenues and other levels of democracy such as in a, uh, on a more of a grassroots level uh, where democracy perhaps uh, exists in more uncontaminated forms today than it uh, exists on the, on, on the larger levels? Well, um... You know, th this is one of these um, paradox kind of situations where democracy is under siege. In part, it's under siege because of the very dynamics that I've been describing. And yet democracy is the only uh, order that can end the siege. So this is paradoxical. And um, that's a kind of paradoxical that we have to, you know, carry with us and move with. Uh, and that's why I wanted to give you that um, brief example at the end, because uh, this uh, movement against surveillance advertising 
really has a huge grassroots dimension. And, uh, and, and this is why I say the three conditions, it's not enough to have the grassroots and it's not enough to have the lawmakers. We need both. The big picture here for me is that the work is political work now. Uh, we're not going to get solutions through the market. We've had 20 years for that to work and it hasn't worked. Things have gotten decidedly worse <laughs> rather than better. So the, the solutions are political. This means that you know, lawmakers don't move unless they feel the public at their backs and the public doesn't move unless they understand and they're mobilized. So, uh, and lawmakers can have a role in helping to <laughs> create that understanding and mobilization. So we've got to have these levels of society, you know, working together. Um, when I go to Capitol Hill, what people tell me is, you know, the only folks who knock on our doors every day are the lobbyists for surveillance capitalism. How thrilled they would be if the next knock on the door came from a group of students or a group of physicians or a group of um, you know, real estate professionals, <laughs> and, you know, pick your sector, uh, a neighborhood group, a community group, a municipal group, it doesn't matter. People need to be organizing at the grassroots in whatever collective makes sense for them. They need to be getting it. They need to be understanding the consequences and, and the stakes. Uh, and they need to be um, out there putting the pressure on lawmakers in very specific, direct ways. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, uh, Jeff, you're next. Let's, let's try and keep it brief. We have some more I'll questions. Very in the line. Brief. Um, uh, I wanted to ask, Shoshana, you were talking about, you know, what, what's going to change. And as you mentioned, it is usually society that needs to be harmed before the street moves that then calls for legislation. So I have a question related to what I call a person's real IT, which is a relationship they choose to have or not have with information technologies. That reflects into their reality. And I know that the game space and the reflection between intention and what comes back is very, um, you know, freighted with a lot of stuff. So one of the premises of a person's relationship is that technology delivers convenience and convenience, the more of a convenience value people sense, the more of an ether that seems to arrive with or anesthetic so that they don't feel the cost pain uh, as it were. And I'm wondering if you think that um, what I call the human operating system, which is our human nature, has these soft spots that get gamed by all this stuff and keeps people complacent and sort of overwhelmed by convenience rather than feeling harm. Thank you very much for everything you do. Well, you know, I know that, um, uh, is there a soft spot? Yes, why is there a soft spot? Because we're all just, you know, uh, worked off our feet. <laughs> I mean, there's a soft spot because, um, you know, our, our schools don't have budgets and our healthcare systems don't have budgets. And, um, and uh, you know, until, very recently and only in, in a few areas, wages, real wages haven't moved since the mid 1970s. Um, and uh, parents are working and there's no support for childcare and on and on and on and on. So yeah, we love convenience, not because there's a soft spot so much or because we're you know, lazy or too affluent or whatever. It's just because nobody's helping us. Nobody's helping us. So, but this is why I, read, I wanted to read you those percentiles because, you know, when people start showing up in the 90 percentile and the 80 percentile saying, you know what, I'm sick of all this stuff. Like every single thing I do, I turn on, you know, some channel to stream a movie and I first got to read the privacy policy. I buy a new dishwasher. I've got to read the privacy policy. What is going on? This thing is, is you know, attacking me from all sides. I want it to end. And, and that's far more important to me than some of the conveniences you know, that come with this stuff. So that come with this stuff. So I think that um, I think 
my reading of the data is that we're at a tipping point and that even though we need the help, people are, are getting fed up. I mean, this is how they sell Alexas and ring doorbells and you know dashboards that survey you and in your car and all these things because they're appealing to our needs that are legitimate needs. But I think that um, the way I read the data, we are at a place where if we can really drive this home now, people are getting fed up and they are not willing to pay the price. Okay, the uh, poll is next up on, on the screen here, but in the chat, uh, Elizabeth uh, has a, I think is a really good question. She said she'd love to hear what you think of Web3, and she adds a parenthesis, I don't see it as a threat to the unified field, but rather a doubling down on the problems of Web2. Uh, and I tend to be in agreement with, with, with her on that. <laughs> well, um... I'm, I'm sure there are many people listening right now who are more expert on Web3 than I am. Um, but here's what I want to say about that. Um, first of all, um, I think that we're kidding ourselves if we think that the solutions to what I've just described uh, begin with technological solutions that uh, do we need uh, different architectures and different kinds of systems uh, that, that allow us to operate in very different ways? Yes, we do. Uh, is having that alone going to uh, drive this uh, positive outcome in the clash of institutional orders? I don't think so, because what we've seen so far is that um, power finds its way into whatever opportunity is there. And if there isn't countervailing law to block it, um, power will find its way into these new spaces. So I think it's, um, you know, it's sort of a reversion to the old technological utopianism if we think just building a different kind of system is going to be enough. Um, I had this conversation with Joyce and, and Doc the other day and I suggested that um, what's really important is that we need to have another technological framework for doing what we want to do as people, as populations, as communities, as individuals, because once we do get the political change, then everybody's gonna be looking around and they're gonna be saying, well, what's the, what's the technology piece that we plug in here? And that needs to be ready. It needs to be turnkey ready. It needs to be good to go. But I think unless it's going into a new a scenario of uh, a new democratic scenario where the democratic rule of law is what is operating over this whole thing with the new rights and institutions and laws that we need, um, then I, I don't think that it can carry the weight by itself. And I'm also quite skeptical of uh, technologies that are designed um, to bypass the problem of trust. Um, uh, it's important in my view to, um, to have technologies that allow us to trust, uh, but that don't bypass the need for social trust because unless we are actively committed to rebuilding social trust, none of the things that, none of the remedies I'm talking about are gonna work. So. Um, you, can't, you can't have a democracy unless you have people who share common sense and trust each other. I stop at the red light, you go at the green light. I go at the green light, I trust that you stop at the red light. <laughs> it Good has to work that way. So Paul, you're next. You have to get off mute. Uh, you're saying things, but uh, you're still on mute. Got to go down the lower left corner there. There you go. 
Nope, we're still not hearing you. Hmm. Um, we're not we're not hearing you, Paul. Can you hear us? Am I audible? Hear me now? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you now. Go ahead. That's good. Um, what Shoshana is talking about is very much the project that I'm working on. Um, I'm about to announce this week a community that I'm forming with some software that I've developed that enables most of the things we're talking about to happen. You, Doc, have been talking about the internet itself started off as a point-to-point -point, um, system, and it's been taken over by the and abused by these big giants, as we're talking about. Um, the the community I'm developing is called Together We Create, which is a system where um, users or members pay a $30 a year US dollar subscription and $27 at least of that money goes back into the community in paying for, for instance, professional software developers to take my software over and turn it into production ready software. And the whole idea is if we can build a community of motivated people, we can do things like have motivated members inside organizations as well as outside organizations and they can work together to make things happen. So just a very quick introduction to what I'm working on. I'm announcing it this week. Um, I'll put the twi my Twitter um, ID in the, uh, ch in the chat and anybody that would like to follow me, you're following me already, Doc, but you may not remember. <laughs> um, so I think it answers very, very many of the points that are being raised. The community is, is uh, I'm setting it up so that it can never be sold, that it has to remain the property of the community members. The community will be a dem democratic community where members say and do things that make it happen. And that's where the Together We Create comes in because the motivated members of the community get in and actually create things and do things. So that's a quick introduction and I'll put a little bit of information on the VRM uh, site. And as I said, I'll put the Twitter um, information on the chat. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, a couple of quick things. Um, uh, Lucy in the chat uh, noted that uh, Etsy sellers are on strike today and two of their key demands are related to data collection and reuse and third-party revenue. They want to end the star seller program and give all sellers the ability to opt out of, opt out, opt out of off-site ads, which is an interesting thing. And um, Michael Grossman uh, says, um, given the survey numbers you cited, wouldn't it seem that demand is starting to exist for competition to proceed the lawmakers that may be small players at first See, for instance, the efforts of the CTA at Collaborative Tech, it seems very analogous to the rise of food consciousness, labeling and organics and so forth, the fringe movement without supporting laws that can move to the mainstream, comma, no. <laughs> so, and that may be the last one. We're, we're, we're running long on time here, so, and, and losing a few people. So, but if you have a question, have an answer to that one. You want me to comment on that? Yes, please. Okay. Um, was was there a, well, was there a question associated with the Etsy example? No, I don't. I know that was Lucy was just okay. sharing that. Okay. It's just a Good. you know okay. something happening in the world. Yeah. All right. Um, to this, I mean, yeah, yes, absolutely. I I I, I agree. Um, you know, things things start can start at the edge and start small, and you know. Um, think of I, I you know, <laughs> granola <laughs> st started, you know, you had to make granola in your kitchen. And it was uh, a statement against all that crap cereal that was clogging the shelves of the supermarket. But then granola ended up uh, in all those crap cereals <laughs> on the shelves of the supermarket. And I think Marcuse wrote a book about that, One Dimensional Man. Uh, so, yes, um, it can start out there. It will probably get co-opted, but um, 
but starting is still important. The thing is, though, that um, you know what the the profits right there is so much concentration now in in the in this uh, you know the giants and their ecosystems there is the concentration is just enormous and um surely exceeding standard oil and and the um the bad boys of, of the 19th century, the late 19th century. So, you know, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to intervene in the global AI market structure without law. It's just not gonna happen. And so to break these, these really significant kind of world historic um, concentrations, uh, my, you know, my analysis is we're going to need law. But as I said, that law comes a lot faster when, uh, when the grassroots and the, um, you know, the, the, the next uh, cultural layer of, of entrepreneurs, you know, is demanding that kind of change. So, um, I, I, you know, I, it's sort of yes, 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 yes to both. Okay. Um, actually, Bill Densmore has a good one here. Um, uh, is there an existing public benefit institution that could supply the democracy power global governance you say is needed, or does one need to be created? If not controlled by a nation state, who would control it? Also, I think Guy or somebody else earlier asked, what about cross-jurisdictional enforcement of law? So that's another interesting question. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah. and then, then we have to wrap it. Okay. Well, I think it's really important, um, and and I I didn't oh. explicitly mention this. What? Oh, I just saw Kevin Cox had his hand up, but I've been wanting him to have his hand up. Oh, so we'll wrap I, it. I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to answer right down to the last question. Yeah, okay. But, but go uh, ahead. Sure. Go, go ahead with on, that one. On y'all. Um, so, uh, you know. It should be made clear, and there's much more to say on this, but when I say, you know, that we need new rights and laws and institutions purpose built, that's kind of all, the only line I had about this in, in my remarks today. But the point here is that we're not taking all of this um, power and taking it from private, private institutional order, um, market-based institutional order, and giving it to the state. That's not the idea. The idea is that we need new charters of rights. We need the laws that oversee those rights. And we need the institutions that oversee and enforce those laws. So this is what um, most democracies, all democracies did in the late 19th and certainly into the 20th century. In America, most of that work came in the fourth decade of the 20th century. Uh, and that's when, you know, uh, the huge uh, amassed power uh, and rights of the industrial age giants, um, employers had all the rights by dint of their property claims. Uh, it wasn't until the fourth decade in America that we really established workers' rights and consumers' rights uh, with the kind of um, comprehensiveness and, and strength uh, that created a whole new equilibrium or at least something like equilibrium between capital and labor. Did it last forever? No. Why? Well, for reasons that I briefly mentioned before, democracy is fragile and there are always forces who are ready to undo it. Um, unfortunately, those forces have taken hold for the last five decades. But, um, but we know that this is, you know, this is a, <laughs> this is a never ending dialectic. So, so the, the point is here that um, we need um, new institutions. If you think about 20th century America, you know, dozens of institutions were created, whether it's the you know, the modern version of the FDA or the, um, 
you know, the Fed or the, you know, the, the um, National Labor Relations Board, National Labor Relations Act, um, whether it's, you know, workers' rights and or economic rights, consumers' rights, there are dozens of institutions uh, and administrative law that was created uh, to tether these industrial giants to the democratic prospect and to, te and to tether in general the industrial economy over a period of time to the democratic prospect. So that's the kind of work of invention that we have simply skipped that step. We're two decades in to the 21st century, the digital century. This is the third decade. And I'm arguing hard to everyone who will listen that this third decade is the decade when we have to undertake these inventions. Europe has a head start. Uh, what they've done so far is not the ultimate solution, uh, but they are on the road. And so, you know, we're not in the dark anymore. We've got some um, interesting examples to learn from, but this is the work that, that has to be done. Um, nation state now, yes, but that's why I've emphasized not only transatlantic, but transnational. You know, this is very much like the climate discussion. It doesn't work only as a nation state. It has to be global, but we have to do the institution building to be able to do that effectively. We're not there yet. Okay, so uh, Kevin, I hate to cut you off uh, after all. Um, let's to try and take, we can talk, take it offline because um, uh, our, our system here is gonna shut us down. Okay. So, um, so thanks so much, everybody. This has been fantastic. There's um, one comment, the, ch the chat is so long, I can't find it, but basically says it's the best talk ever. And, and when are we gonna have part two? So, um, so that says something right there. Thanks so much, Shoshana. This has been fabulous as expected. And thanks for so many people for hanging in. It's been great. And uh, <laughs> getting other chats coming in saying thank you. So. I just wanna say um, thank you to all of you and thank you for staying. I'm sorry if I, if I spoke for too long. I uh, had a, we had a problem with the link at the very end and I was rushing and I didn't even bring my phone in here. So I literally had no clock and I was just kind of thinking yeah. that somebody would wave at me if things got too, too long. But in any case, I'm really grateful for your, your time and your interest and, um, and just thank you. Thank you so much. And, and anybody wants to save their own chat, uh, the three little dots at the bottom of the chat thing, you click on that and have it save chat. It does that. Um, this is of course going to be, um, online. We're going to have the whole thing on there for those who missed it. So thanks again, everybody for showing yeah. up. Thank this you, Shoshana. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Thanks Thank everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.